I, can hear I am indeed, yes. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I'd like to, to thank Alt for the opportunity of uh, giving this presentation this afternoon and for everyone for, for being here. So the object of the, of the presentation is to, to talk about our new project, Nexus, which is promoting well, the Nexus inter, intersection of uh, interaction of uh, migrants through active um, citizenship. This is a three-year project we just uh, we just started last last uh, September. So what problem we, are we trying to, to solve here? I mean, I think you can uh, tease out the answer to that question by looking at some of the quotes from uh, an EC white paper. Um, well, the first one, for example, that the idea that the number of young people involved in traditional structures is, is, is declining. It's like, if you like, a sense of alienation from classical uh, democratic and institutional processes. And uh, we're particularly interested in what we can do to help people with this younger people, and specifically uh, migrants. That doesn't mean we're trying to exclude other social groups, but uh, previously we worked with um, refugees and migrants. We're very interested in, in social inclusion, so therefore it kind of made sense to, to move forward with this with this area. Um, here's some very brief project uh, information. Um, it's a K203 Erasmus Plus project and we have partners as you can see from seven um, countries here and um, as I say we started last uh, last September. And our objectives are various whether we can actually get them all done at the by the end of the project is another matter but we'll certainly give it our, our best shot. I mean we certainly would like to try and innovate the civic education process and as I say we're starting off with migrant higher education students because that those are the students we have easier access to but it doesn't mean we're not excluding anybody in there. We're also interested in exploring the relationship between the um, participatory digital tools and the actual e-democratic uh, processes because there's a lot of tools available but it's actually sometimes hard to quantitatively measure the cause and effect here. Um, perhaps what's a, a, a new uh, inclusion for this kind of work is, is that of service learning and in fact we're, we're trying to raise the bar a little here and, and introduce the concept of virtual service learning and I'll talk about this a little later on. Um, when we talk about educator awareness, I mean on a lot of our projects we focus specifically on the uh, students but we'd like to also think about the educators here. It's a two-edged sword if you like. I think there's a lot of uh, transverse learning that uh, students are, are lucky enough to receive when they start in higher education, and I think civics could also uh, be part of that. We'd like to boldly take uh, civics to the, the fourth uh, level, if I can split my infinitives for a second there, and I'll, I'll define clearly what I mean about that a little later on. And then we've got some concrete actions we're going to try and do in the project, which once again I can I can come back to. So when we're talking about active citizenship, I think we can use the uh, the slide from Breakaway here to give us a bit of a flavor of what we uh, we actually uh, actually mean here. And I don't want to get into defining it because I really haven't got enough time. But I mean, if you like, it's it's helping people to become potentiating people so that they become. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Tracer. Another, another Trek fan in the room with us. This is good. Um, making people proactive and uh, and taking charge of their own process, but also helping them to be able to do that. When we talk about uh, online democracy, digital democracy, e-democracy, there's a lot been published about this. I mean, I think the next figure is uh, is quite nicely used. It uh, tends to be presented as a, as, a, as a sequential process, and I'm not sure that's necessarily the the case, at least that's some of the thought we have in the, in the project here. But uh, we're certainly looking at uh, exploring uh, some of these these nodes on this um, on this chart here. Um, there are also um, quite a lot. There's also a lot of quite a lot of work uh, being done online. If you look on the right hand side of this figure, um, these are the sorts of examples we can uh, find online. So, for example, um, crowdsourcing um, ideas for local improvement. There's a, there's a couple of really nice uh, projects been done in Iceland, and we can find them online. And on the left hand side, it's just a small taste of the sorts of tools and um, online social environments where, where work's been presented on that. For example, in Participate uh, DB, there's been, they've been working very hard and diligently for more than 25 years. And they've got almost 400 tools. Completely blows me away every time I try and actually get my head around uh, what's actually there. So we're trying to, if you like, focus in and, and develop a best of breed um, set of tools for people here. Okay, so if I'm able to. Uh, quote a, a colleague of mine from the, the, the project, Elisa, if we can be a little bit more clear about this, about e-democracy as being the use of ICT to support the democratic decision-making process, then we can identify three parts, okay? We've got the e-government, we've got e-transparency, 
and we've got the part which is uh, interesting us, which is the e-participation. This is acting uh, actively trying to get people to actually participate in this um, in this uh, feedback loop. And it's actually interesting because actually having had, been lucky enough to have a lot of contact with refugees and the migrants in the past, um, a lot of people I've spoken to are only too pleased to be in a, in a semi-stable social environment and really want to keep their head down below the radar and aren't that necessarily keen to become active and participate with uh, citizens. And that's something that we were trying to help them with. Um, there's a huge uh, literature and a, a lot of uh, previous work. I'm just including a, a taste here on the uh, on the slide. I mean, for example, there's um, there's uh, 17 different MOOCs that have been around. There's guides. There's some open courseware. There's what um, I'm calling text plus because they're uh, in the majority they're text, but they do have some interactive elements included and videos and and and, and text. Uh, and TED Talks as well. So it's not a question of being lost for things to, to use or reuse. It's a question of how we can actually uh, pull out what's actually appropriate for each of the different strands of the activities we're trying to do in this, in this project. Um, okay, one particular thing that does concern us from a, um, a scientific and research perspective is this um, question of how to actually know if the uh, students who are taking part in our e-petition are actually achieving the outputs they, they want. Are they actually able to connect and collaborate and research and, and reach the issues they're trying to actually uh, handle with? And that's actually leading us into, because we don't have necessarily all the answers just yet, um, the right kind of metrics and rubrics we're going to be developing in combination with our tools and platforms to be able to pick up that information. And that's something that I hope we'll, uh, we'll be able to contribute um, later on in, in the project. Service learning, I briefly mentioned this, and I do apologize for screaming forward at the speed of light here, but there's a kind of a lot to get through. I mean, service learning is something which is uh, not new in the sense it was presented in 96 as a form of ex um, experiment, experiential education. I'm engaging students in activities, taking them beyond the, the cozy niche of academia into the real world. And um, it's received a lot of attention. It's popular in the US and um, it's also been criticized in the literature, as should be the case. But we think for participation, this, this notion of uh, moving forward into virtual service learning um, could actually be quite an effective way of engaging students. We've done similar things with online um, work experience with students, and we, and we think we might have a way of being able to include this in the project. But uh, I think it could be a, a, a good way because, I mean, they say the best way to, to learn something is to teach it, and I think the best way to, to gain a competence is to, uh, is to actually try it in a real world situation. And it can be win-win, can, it, can, it can be win for, good for the community, the students actually helping, the, the niche group, and also good for them in terms of actually producing results and also improving their competences in, in this area. Okay, so this is where we are at the moment. We're trying to develop, um, based upon an analysis of the literature, the actual units we want to have as micro-learning units that can be used in face-to-face -face teaching and also for online uh, uh, MOOCs. And I put this here as proposed units because this is very uh, much work in process. And uh, this might well change over the next few months. But Tom, um, I mean, we certainly want to to lay the basis of what our active citizenship is and why it should be of interest to our to our students. And then move on to some of the things we think are most important, like uh, telling stories with data. I mean, there's lots of open data around, but uh, knowing what the good from the bad and how to to analyze it, I think, is non-trivial. To put it mildly, how to change, how to monitor and influence different times of uh, social groups. Sorry, did I hear something there? I Hello? I think we're okay. Hello? We, we, can, we can hear you loud and clear. I oh, good. I, I didn't know I could hear somebody speaking. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll soldier on. So if you like, the idea that we're thinking about for our curriculum design would be to combine um, explanatory uh, materials given by, by people who are experts in each of these different areas with regional case studies. Because at the end of the day, if I'm trying to engage with Spanish students and I'm giving them a case study in Sweden, it might be hard for them to, to relate to and to participate in. So these really do need to be regional tools, uh, regional studies, and then combining the participative tools with uh, with virtual social learning. So that's where we are at the moment, okay? And where we're gonna be in the next uh, 
few months is uh, basically preparing a couple of, uh, of MOOCs. The first one, Civics for Active Citizenship and Participation in the Digital Age. We'll hopefully be getting this out the door in, in October um, of this year on, the, on our Open UNED, Open edX platform. And then we'll have a, a more vertically structured MOOC at the beginning of 2022 when we're coming towards the end of uh, the project to actually help people to learn and to use the tools that we're, we're promoting. Um, one thing we're also working on is the idea of a six uh, toolbox to help people with the tools that are around. And as I mentioned before in the talk, there's just so many, it's hard to know actually where to, to, to focus your attention here. So in a way, what we're humbly trying to, to do is to produce a short list of what we might want to call best of breed tools and produce the appropriate metadata and, uh, and uh, tutorial material to actually help people to, to realize what they can actually do with the tools because most of the tools claim they're open source, but then when you come to use them, it's not always that easy, uh, for example. Um, the result of this, uh, this toolbox will be similar to the result that we, or our colleagues of ours from KIC produced in the EduHack project, which is actually quite a nice website with links to the tools and also the supporting information and, uh, supporting information and actually the tools themselves. So we'll actually build a, a community um, around that. Okay, so as I'm um, coming towards the end of the, uh, of the talk here, let me get on to, to, uh, to Civics 4.0. And this is where I stick my neck out of it in the, uh, in the presentation, because uh, I think I said earlier at the beginning that, okay, we can quite e easily accept that uh, civics is the studying rights and duties of uh, citizenship because uh, there's both sides of the coin here. I mean, we, we have rights, but we also have uh, responsibilities and both uh, have to be uh, accepted. So if we can, we can look at 1.0, then I think that's the way that civics has been, has been taught quite a lot in face-to-face in -face education. Then moving on to 2.0, then I, I think that's a pretty much a no-brainer, the idea of just applying straight 2.0 techniques to um, civic education. A lot's been done. I think there's been some very admirable uh, uh, project work. That's out there. I can't speak highly enough about it. But um, I think it's analogous to the idea that if the only tool you have is a, a hammer, and everything around you becomes nails. And I think that if we if we divide the project up in a different way, the pro the, uh, the problems we're trying to solve, then maybe we can come up with uh, solutions that are slightly more flexible. Uh, Three point zero, which is was something we came across when we were were putting this uh, this project proposal together. Um, a while ago was this idea of bottom-up, community-driven transformation. And I think we've seen a lot of this going on. There's some really nice uh, uh, examples going on, like the Yellow Jackets in France, the, the uh, Catalan independence in the north east of Spain. Dare I mention Brexit? But anyway, there's, there's lots of examples going on. So, I mean, here we can see some really exciting changes and contrast between representative democracy and direct democracy. And I think we're beginning to see the, the power of the community. So what we're hoping to do with 4.0 here is to really potentiate the connection of students to their institutions in the digital age. Because um, sometimes when I'm lucky enough to, to have conversations with uh, our students uh, about this and, and they complain about things, I mean, it doesn't have to be big uh, solving third world hunger problems. It can be something as, as much as the fact that they're not particularly happy about the way their local community is, is working when they're uh, where they live. So the, the typical answer is, well, that's really good. Why don't you do something about it? Take part. Go and, uh, go and uh, shake some of the, the people who actually have some, some power in this and try and produce some change. And they want to. They like it. But they're not always clear of the best ways to do that. So I think if we can really harness on this idea of service learning and the tools we want to, to connect in, then um, I think we could, if, even if we can't particularly solve it, we can certainly try and take a step towards this particular this solution. So thank you very much. That's what I, uh, I wanted to, to say briefly in, in this uh, presentation. I very much hope to be able to be back next year, hopefully uh, face to face to give uh, you an update on this and more than uh, grateful for any comments or criticisms or questions that anybody has. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Timothy, for that. That was really interesting. If anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand and you can have the mic or we can take them in the chat as well.
so there's just a question here for you, Timothy, from Greg. Um, Greg wants to know if there's a website where he can keep updated on this. Um, not right now. We're um, we're prototyping the web uh, development at the moment, and we'll have one out in the uh, in the, uh, hopefully well by next week. It would have been nice to have had it done by now, but it's uh, it's been developed, and uh, I'll um, um, I'll make a note of your contact, Greg, and uh, and send that to you. Thanks. Thanks, Timothy. There's also just a second question here from Gabby, and that's um, she wants to know if if we do the MOOC, we'll get to explore all of those cool tools. I wish. Um, <laughs> my experience of doing MOOCs is the four plus two model works. I mean, we've been doing MOOCs for uh, quite a long time now, and um, the four plus two is one week warm up, four weeks of work, and one week cool down. So in four weeks, being able to try out all the tools, I think, would be a little uh, a little hard work. And as I said, if we go to the um, the participate DB, they're, they've got at least at least 400, so we go crazy. I think what we'll do would be to uh, go back to the um, the curriculum design we've got here. If you can see the slides on, I'm not sure if it's still on this. And um, for example, for each particular unit um, is where we'd center the tools. At least that's in the in the first uh, MOOC. The first MOOC is going to be if you like broad and shallow. So the idea is to give people a general understanding of um, the, the questions without dying in the process. So for example, in organizing campaigns, we could probably put the top, uh, you know, in our opinion, maybe the top um, three or five tools that are actually useful in a particular application of ordering, um, organizing campaigns. And then in the regional case studies, getting people to find uh, a particular issue that's close to them and then try the tools out in that context. But I mean, you're completely right. I mean, people have to use the tools. If you don't use the tools, you're not really gonna, gonna get much from it. And then toward the end of the project, when we do the vertical MOOC and we're more focusing in on specific tools, then it will be more of a workshop about trying the, the, the tools out. And um, if I'm throwing stones at my own uh, roof here, as we like to say, one of the criticisms of um, some of the tools I, I found is they're really great. I mean, some people, have, have, you can tell they've gone to a lot of trouble. They spend tens of thousands of years developing open apps and stuff. And then when you actually try and apply them in different contexts, it's not always quite so easy. But I'm, I don't wish to criticize anyone here because I'm not sure I could do it any better. But it's just things that you need to be aware of when you're trying to uh, think of the, uh, the tools that are actually available. That's great. Thanks, Timothy. And there's just one final question here from Teresa. Um, she's asking if you could unpack the problem you briefly mentioned around open source tools. Uh, that's, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Um, unpack the, the questions. I mean, perhaps it's um, a question of, of how many different tools there are. So, for example, if hypothetically speaking, I'm trying to locate, um, I'm getting contact with my, my regional council to complain about for example, bus services. I mean, for example, where I live, bus services aren't radial. They're, they're, well, they are radial. They go from where I live in my village to the very center of the city and back out again, which is not necessarily the best way of, uh, of, um, of doing it. So wouldn't it be nice if I could actually get my voice heard? And um, while open government and transparent information and access to these resources are all terribly popular in, in inverted commas, when I actually try and find the damn tool and contact, communicate, and transmit my frustrations, I find it very difficult. So if I find it difficult, who perhaps is an academic, I'm used to trawling my way through these sorts of tools, then how might other people with maybe not so much experience actually find it uh, difficult to uh, to do? Oh, thanks, Teresa. <laughs> Sorry, I won't repeat myself if, um, if I seem to answer the, answer the question. But I mean, I think we do need to, uh, to focus in really and, and help people to find the most appropriate tools. Thanks very much, Timothy. That was really, really interesting. Um, thanks for all your questions as well. And if we could give Timothy a virtual round of applause, and then that would be very, very nice for him. Thank you. And don't forget, there's the social space as well. So if anyone wants.